Welcome to Boxing Inform, your host, The Islander, and this is my uh, monthly or several weekly uh, edition here. I know a lot of you have been hounding me to go ahead and do a video, so for the sake of doing a video, I'm going to do one, but there are a couple of points of interest. You know, I can't cover every single thing that's happened in a vacuum between the last time I did a video and, and this time, but there's uh, three or four or five things I do want to talk about and um, expand upon so you guys can discuss it on the video. Uh, on the comments or on my channel. And it's one of the reasons why I kind of, you know, when boxing is slow or I'm busy at work or what, what, what have you, I kind of stay idle because you guys are provided a forum to discuss back and forth, you know, your uh, observations and grievance, grievances. Anybody wants me to do a political video, let me know. Also, it would behoove you to probably turn down your volume as this could get uh, rough. Uh, as you know, this is Wednesday morning, and this is the day after Election Day. And I only have one thing to say as I slept good last night, and that is, goodbye fucking Nancy Pelosi. Goodbye to you. Get rid of your 757 jet and ride your fucking broom back to that septic tank that you fucking live in. All right, with that out of my system, and I'm sorry for those of you who might be offended by that, there's four things on my agenda. Um, one of the first things that happened weeks ago was uh, Oscar De La Hoya came out and made an announcement that boxing should be run like the UFC, in which there should be one promoter and one league and one champion per division and blah, 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 and who do you think he, he, he expected to be the one? Himself, of course! What have I been telling you people all along about this? He is in cahoots with HBO trying to take over the, the whole sport! And for those of you who would indulge and listen to me, I told you. He's been trying this for a long, long time. And I still personally believe he is behind the whole Margarito scandal with the hand wraps. Not that he put them in there or anything like that, but he's the one who's blown it out of, out of proportion to the, to the epic proportions that it is. He is behind that. Using HBO as his voice, his mouthpiece, he is the one who facilitated this epic, epic monster Montrosity, which is really much to do about almost nothing. Listen, this guy has a hard enough time, has not brought one prospect from pro debut to a world title yet. His best process, prospects are over the hill Hall of Fame inductee candidates. Well, that's another thing I need to talk about the Hall of Fame. Himself, Mosley, and Hopkins to guys he's stolen away from top rank, Victor Ortiz, uh, to Neville Wilbies or, or fighters that are just protected, you know, that Arizon de Lara is the real McCoy, I will say that. So, I mean, I'm not going to wish anything bad on him because he's a really good fighter, I think he's really special, and Dale Hoya and Golden Boy are probably lucky to have him. But the thing is, what people don't understand about, about this whole thing, and Dale Hoya obviously doesn't because he's just barely a high school graduate, is that boxing is not like the MMA. Boxing is not like the UFC, which is part of MMA. It's an everyday, daily event. If you go on BoxRec.com and click on any date, you will see multiple cards all around the world. No single boxing promoter can stage cards all around the world. Multiple sites, every day of the week, every day of the year. Every day of the year, just about, there is boxing going on somewhere in the world. Not world championship boxing, but boxing in four and six round fights, multiple places in the United States, all across the world globally. One promoter cannot do it. I don't know what... I, I, I like the, what do you call it, the reaction by the other promoters like Bob Arum. You know, he's absolutely, quoted as saying, Dale is absolutely nuts. He's, he's, he's hell-bent on on taking over the entire sport. There's, you know, they thought that Sugar Ray Leonard was, was trying to do the same thing when he was interfering and meddling with the 1988 Olympic boxing team, trying to get all those guys signed up with him. The same thing was thought, and he was kind of quickly pushed aside because at the time, guys like Don King and the Duvers and Bob Arum were really, really powerful, where it was very difficult for an outside promoter to get on the inside. All right, enough of that. De La Hoya and Golden Showers promotions <laughs> it's a joke, okay? The Super 6 tournament seems to be falling apart. You know, 
I knew this seemed like a good idea from a concept standpoint, but uh, let me pause this and put plug in the thing before the battery goes out. I'll be right back. Okay, we're plug we're plugged in. We're on AC power. No more worrying about the battery uh, dying. The Super Six, good concept to begin with. But when you looked at the time schedule and how long it would take for the tournament to unroll, un un you know, just un unroll and that there was a loser's bracket and this and that, a lot of people like myself had some doubts. Then, with boxers getting the ability to just take themselves out of the tournament, in Jermaine Taylor's case, I understand, suffering two, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, two knockouts back to back. Uh, brutal knockouts, I can understand. But Mikkel Kessler deciding he loses his first fight to Andre Ward, then squeaks by uh, Carl Frosch in a rematch, decides, you know, I'm not going to be subjected to, you know, one of these matchups again, and I'm going to take myself out and I'll fight the winner of the tournament. The way I look at this is, unless something is single elimination with maybe a consolation or a loser's bracket, it's never going to work correctly. And with that said, this tournament's in jeopardy now. I, I, nobody will explain to me why Andre Ward is going to get to fight three straight fights in, in the comfy confines of Northern California. When I saw Carl Frosch fight a fight at home, then he went to Denmark. Michael Kessler fought the first fight, his first fight with Andre Ward on the road, then got a home match. Uh, Andre Durrell had to go to England to fight Frosch first, and then got a fight against Abraham at, in, in Detroit. Abraham got a fight against Jermaine Taylor at home, then had to go to Detroit to fight Durrell. Everybody's gone home away or away home back and forth, except for Andre Wood. I don't, I don't understand this. Why is this guy so special? Understand, I think he's the favorite to win the tournament, but why are the cards falling if this guy gets to fight Kessler at home, gets to fight Alan Green at home, and I heard his next fight supposed to be in Northern California as well. I, 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 don't, I don't get this. So, if you want to know why it's falling apart, it's because there's inconsistencies. And I personally would, would have preferred that they expand the field to eight guys. They would have had four quarterfinal fights. All four, the four winners would square off in a final four, two bouts on the same card in the same place, and then the two winners would meet. They could have other consolation matches along the way. <coughs> Excuse me again. In any event, the Bantamweight uh, tournament that's being held in uh, Mexico, I'll talk more about in December. Four guys, two separate fights, the two winners meet, the two losers meet, and basically the winners of those last bouts are going to meet again after the tournament's over. Solid. ESPN, as well as the Inglewood or Great Western Forum, back in the 80s and the early 90s, used to run a tournament for a weight class. As a matter of fact, to give you a good example of this, the junior welterweight division had a tournament that had nothing to do with ESPN. It was just strictly the Great Western Forum, in which they had eight guys, they had four bouts, then they had two, then they had a championship bout. There were upsets along the way, there were surprises, there was you know, some, a little bit of controversy, but in the end, Sammy Fuentes of Puerto Rico ended up fighting Rodolfo Aguilar of Panama in the final, and Sammy Fuentes, in an upset, won the whole tournament. What did he get for winning the tournament? He got himself a shot at Julio Cesar Chavez's WBC Super Lightweight title, in which he fought very well in the fight before being stopped in the 10th round. But that is the way tournaments and boxing should work. I know they're trying to find a successor for Joe Calzaghe, but when the best won't fight the best and they were scheduled to fight the best, the whole thing is, is falling apart, in my opinion. And that's, that's what I think. You know, putting um, Glenn Coff Johnson in, in the mix, uh, and, you know, with Darrell out because of injury and this and that, or you know, whatever happened to his, 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 his brain from that shot he took from Arthur Abraham, a good idea, but again, now you've got guys who are capable of losing just about any time out, like Johnson and Alan Green. 
that it diminishes the accomplishments of the Kesslers or the uh, Abrahams or the Froshes of the world, and that's just my opinion. I think the, the, the tournament's shot right now. Then we had a significant heavyweight bout in Germany uh, two weeks ago in which Shannon Briggs promised to make uh, Vitaly Klitschko fight and Vitaly Klitschko pitched a shutout over him and I will say this, that is one of the more frightening beatings I've ever seen somebody take but with this said, Shannon Briggs is one tough mother, uh, probably too tough for his own good and I was amazed at the amount of punishment he was able to take and stay on his feet and, and still at, at least appear to be competitive even though he wasn't. Um, there was always the chance that he'd land a lucky punch. I mean, even as I was watching, I didn't think it was going to happen, but you know, all it took was the Hail Mary, the Sunday punch, and, and you know, he was still trying for them in the, in the last round as Klitschko was trying to knock him out. Uh, it was a terrible fight. Um, but it was terrible because one person's skill level was vastly superior to the other and the person who had inferior skill set had a ton of heart, a ton of determination, and a ton of toughness that will never ever be questioned. That is one of the things about Shannon Briggs is that when he was coming up there were questions about his heart, questions about his desire, he was deemed the next Muhammad Ali because he was charismatic and this, this and that. And a lot of people forgot he gave Lennox Lewis one hell of a fight. I mean, gave Lennox Lewis hell for five rounds before he finally collapsed out of exhaustion. Uh, will this be probably the last significant fight of Shannon Briggs' career? Probably not, because I think that, you know, somehow he'll probably manage to get himself a fight with, with Vladimir Klitschko eventually. And I, I think he deserves I, I think in some ways if he fights a couple of contenders and beats him, he deserves it. Um, that's just me. Now, um, for Vitaly Klitschko, um, he keeps making his case as the best heavyweight in the division, although he cedes that to his brother Vladimir. And they're starting to run out of competition. Uh, David Hay, on the other hand, uh, one of these weeks is fighting Audley Harrison uh, in what is amounting to be a joke of a fight, although I really hope that, like Margarito, Audley Harrison can understand that this is his absolute last chance and get himself into super duper shape. It's not impossible, get his mind right, and it don't take much, it's only going to take one shot to, to, to whack out David Hay when he gets hit with a heavyweight shot. So, uh, it'll be interesting while it lasts, but you know, I expect David Hay to win that fight. Now I turn my attention to the Hall of Fame ballots out, and like baseball and other sports, a boxer has to be inactive for five years in order to be eligible and this year's, in 2011, this year's ballot is going to contain Mike Tyson and Julio Cesar Chavez as well as Costa Zhu. I can't believe it's been five years already since Ricky Hatton put the, the whammy on Costa Zhu. But uh, it's, I think all three of them, I, I know Julio Cesar Chavez without question is Hall of Fame material. Costa Zhu yeah, probably. I mean, he, you know, undisputed junior welterweight champion, his record in world title fights, he only lost two fights total in his career. Uh, his skill set vastly underrated, vastly underrated skill set that guy had. I thought for sure when he fought Zab Jude, I thought for sure he was done, that he was going to get absolutely laid to waste. And the first round, it looked like all my predictions in my mind had come true. But his skill set leveled the playing field in the second round until he exposed Zab Judah for who Zab Judah was. And that is probably the, if you want to take the, the dichotomy or the uh, a cross section of Zab Judah's career, that would probably be one of the best fights because he wasn't the greatest technician of all time and he wasn't the greatest boxer of all time, but he had a vastly underrated skill set that was shown in that fight where he was outgunned in the first round and totally leveled the playing field in the second round before scoring a stoppage. Uh, so I go with him. Tyson, you know, I think more of his reputation early on as this destroyer in the, in the early 80s is what gets him by and gets him on this, this, this ticket because after his loss to Buster Douglas, his career was very average at best. And if you don't believe me, just look at the names and look at the results before Buster Douglas and after. 
You know, he had beaten some really good fighters. Uh, Larry Holmes hadn't fought in like two and a half or three years when Tyson knocked him out. But, you know, again, I've always said the job still has to be done. And Michael Spinks, I think, was idle for about a year and a half or two years when, when Tyson blew him out. I mean, with the exception of Evander Holyfield, there are only, I think, three fighters on his resume who are Hall of Fame criteria that and two of them that he beaten, which are Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks, because he lost the Holyfield twice. <sighs> Let's put it this way, I think lesser fighters in the Hall of Fame, so I'll give Tyson his due and give him his entrance way. He did more for boxing in terms of pay per view sales and interest in, in a time when uh, the sport was becoming lean because what a lot of people don't realize is that there are segments in, in boxing in which if you go way back to say even, you know, Joe Lewis's time. I mean, Joe Lewis gave way and a heavyweight when Marciano was taken over and more importantly, Sugar Ray Robinson was in the prime and twilight of his career. And that gave way in, in the 1960s to Cassius Clay who became Muhammad Ali, which went stretched all the way from the 60s into the 70s. And at the end of the 70s and the early 80s, Ali gave way to Sugar Ray Leonard who was on and off and retired in this in the, in the 80s with, you know, with a mix of the, the golden age of boxing with Hagler and Hearns and Duran and, and Holmes and Arguello and Pryor and Sanchez and Gomez and so on and so forth, that it sweeps forward into the 90s where it gave way to Tyson. And then Tyson went off into the 90s with Holyfield and Bo and Lewis and all those guys and De La Hoya and Chavez and, you know, all of them picked up at the end of the 80s into the 90s you know, and onward. And I think that one of the things that we can we can really thank Mike Tyson for is that he was a segue or a conduit from the end of Sugar Ray Leonard and Holmes and Ali and them into this new decade which went to the millennium. So yeah, I'll give him the uh those all three of them, the uh the Hall of Fame green light and uh, wish them all the best, and it's going to be one spectacular scene. I, I really wish I could go. I've never been to Canastota, New York, but I would really wish to go this year, because uh, Julio Cesar Chavez is one of my favorite boxers of all time, by far none. I mean, he basically picked up where Salvador Sanchez left off, in, in my mind. That brings us to the uh, Pacquiao Margarito 24-7. You know, one thing I want to say about these shows, which is um, not really uh, critical, by the way, it's the middle of the day, and I am at work. Uh, is that the first show is usually the best. The best for outlining what the situation is, what you're going to be seeing, a little bit of backstory, and basically laying out an outline. I think in every one where there's a series of 24-7, the first show is usually the best one. Now, we've had two shows so far. We've gotten to see Antonio Margarito rip a nasty fart with his wife present. We got to see Pacquiao in the House of Representatives in, in, in Manila and the typhoons and all the other stuff that goes along with it. And in the second episode, my favorite part is them basically taping the brick, the, uh, the, the piece of cinder block to Margarito's hand and telling him, don't look, don't look, as they're uh, playing up to that BS that that, uh, who do you call it, uh, you know, HBO keeps wanting to uh, use as the controversy, you know, as a controversy and, and all this other stuff. Here's the deal. You know, a lot of people are playing up this thing that Pacquiao's not in the best shape, not ready, he's distracted, this and that. I think even at 50 to 75 percent Pacquiao will still probably win this fight. I think Margarito, on the other hand, is reminding me of a... There's, there's some situations in boxing where we've written guys off before and said that they're too old, they're too beat up, they've got too many miles on them. Just cast them aside. In 1983, Roberto Duran was coming off of absolutely the lowest part of his career. He had quit against Sugar Ray Leonard like uh, two and a half years earlier, a little, a little more than two years earlier, at the end of 1980, in the Nomas fight, he had 
moved up to junior middleweight and looked terrible in two, in two fights there before being nearly embarrassed by Wilfred Benitez over 15 rounds of a fight he clearly lost. And then, the worst of worst, he, in, 19, in September 1982, he fought a, I guess, a, a journeyman Englishman named Kirkland Lang on ESPN in Detroit and was outboxed, out hustled, and lost a 10 round decision to this relative nobody. He was written off, left for dead. There was an opportunity in night, coming forward in 1983 to fight two fights back to back for himself. One against former welterweight champion Pepino Cuevas in Los Angeles at the uh, Olympic Auditorium, which was going to be a massive venue with the Mexicans coming out to support Cuevas. And then the winner would get a shot against Davey Moore, the WBA champion of the 154-pound division, who only had like eight fights, but was a massive puncher and had a lack of experience. Duran got himself into the absolute best shape of his life to duke it out mano a mano with Pepino Cuevas and stop Cuevas. Duran hadn't stopped any fighter in years previous to that. I'm talking this is kind of like a Joshua Clotty thing where he had it been like, you know, four years since he'd scored a stoppage over anybody. But against Cuevas, who is also shot like him, they both brought their A, well, I should say Duran brought his A game and stopped Cuevas in four rounds. Parlayed that into June of that year. He was a big underdog against Davey Moore on his 32nd, birth, 32nd birthday at Madison Square Garden. I remember I was like, about to turn 13, I was like, yeah, Duran's going to do it. My dad's like, don't waste your time worrying about this. He's going to get himself whacked out. And he put on a clinic, stopping Davey Moore in the eighth round. And the resurrection and the renaissance of his career was born at that point. Margarito is in the same situation. He's been left for dead. The fight against Mosley was horrendous. The fight against, uh, what's his name, Ayala, no, uh, against Garcia, in his last fight, he looked horrendous. Looked just like Duran did against against uh, oh that guy from Bayamone, New Jersey, uh, Nino Gonzalez and Luigi Minchillo. That's what that, it, he looked like Durant against those against uh, Gar Gar Roberto Garcia, whatever the guy's name is. Just like Duran did against Luigi Minchillo and um, Nino Gonzalez, looked terrible. But it's what motivates these guys that makes them dangerous, and. Margarito is as motivated or even more motivated than he was when he got into the ring against Cotto when he was he was a decided underdog against Cotto. Understand a couple of things. Pacquiao is up here and Cotto is here. Okay. Being up for being motivated for Cotto and being able to do what he did to Cotto is not the same thing as being able to do to Pacquiao. Pacquiao what worries me about him after seeing these 24-7s, especially the first one, is that he's becoming too Americanized. What do I mean by that? What, what are you talking about, Islander? What are you talking about? The one statement I saw him make on camera, where he was saying about Margarito and his hand wraps, how did he know? He, how could he not know? I, oh, I'm not watching this, that. Making fun of that. that. He's becoming too much like our society now. Thinking ways that he wouldn't think before. One thing about other cultures and other societies, they're very honorable. There isn't this satire or this sarcasm or this um, any, any of this negativity, generally speaking, in these other cultures amongst themselves or amongst their opponents and this and that. Now, there, you know, there's disdain for the opponent, understand this, but, but the joking and the, uh, you know, the sarcasm usually does not exist. This is something new I'm seeing from Pacquiao, and it kind of worries me. I don't know that any boxer on the planet, with the exception of Floyd Mayweather, has the ability to beat him. Only I think he can beat himself. And this is something that's, when, once it gets into your mind, it doesn't leave. And this Americanization of his thinking is what's worrying me. It, will, it may be his downfall. In regards to fighting, though, I don't see how Margarito is going to be able to win the numbers game against Pacquiao. I expect, the, and I'm going to do another video before the fight, of course, to stay current with 24-7, I expect this fight to look a lot like Pacquiao's fight with David Diaz. The only thing is, is that Margarito, if 
Pacquiao lands the left hand they land on David Diaz or Ricky Hatton, Margarito's probably going to smile at him. This is going to be a stick and move box, tie him up kind of a fight. And the question is, can Margarito do enough damage to Pacquiao's arms, body, hips, legs, whatever, to cash in between rounds 9 and 12? It's the only chance he has in this fight. I don't think he's going to hit Pacquiao with any one punch and hurt him. I don't think Pacquiao's going to hit Margarito with any one single punch and hurt him. Whoever reaps the accumulation of shots on the other guy is the one who's going to win this fight, or Pacquiao is going to easily win the numbers game, in my opinion. But, I don't know. One thing I do know is that I can get on Margarito Pacquiao. I can tell you about that. You're going to get crazy to my eyesight showing. I was watching Margarito work with the pants on the top of the body belt with Robert Garcia in the ring. And I swear, even with training gloves on, it looks like his hands are going fast. I've ever seen them move in a, in a real fight. And I, I'm thinking to myself, could that be... I mean, could that be right? Am I seeing things? Or maybe I just haven't watched him fight in a long time, but he looked like his hands were moving faster doing that pad work than I have ever seen him move in the ring ever before. I'm just hoping for a good fight. I really think Pacquiao's just got too much skill and too much, too much footwork, too much hand speed, too much in-and-out movement to really... You know, blow this thing. I'm going to try to get another. Um, I'm trying to think of what's coming up this weekend. I ought to look real quick uh, to see on the schedule. To see what I need to preview. Oh, another little thing. Uh, this uh, Hector Macho Camacho Jr. iced in one round by Lemieux in Montreal. The thing about ESPN3 is, is that on my internet connection at home, I'm not one of the. I, I don't belong to one of the. Uh, I guess the internet service providers that, that allows it. So I, I've got to go somewhere else to see it if I want to see on something on ESPN3.com. Uh, Jose Cotto, blah, blah, blah. Brian Valoria taking on Lean Patch Sor Virov Paul in Manila in the flyweight division. Uh, go, with, uh, go with Valoria in that fight. It's at 112. November 6th, Las Vegas, Juan Manuel Lopez versus Rafael Marquez, unless this has been called off, for Lopez's WBO featherweight title on Showtime, as well as Glenn Johnson versus Alan Green in another segment of, I guess, the loser's bracket of the Super Six. I'm... If you asked me a year ago about this fight, I would have told you Lopez going away easy. Their careers are heading in opposite directions. That was until Lopez has hit a few speed bumps. One, he has a neglect for defense recently. Two, his chin has become suspect. Marquez is still a sharp, sharp puncher. I think he's two weight classes out of his best weight class, though. And Lopez should be able to do enough to um, hold him off. But I would not be surprised. I think the fight could go either way, but I would, I would favor Lopez just on his youth and his speed. Southpaw, you know... Normally, he'd have an advantage of being a southpaw, but Marquez, when he was in his prime, had the absolute best, one of the best weapons to combat a southpaw, and that was a straight lead right hand. We'll see if Lopez can stay away from that right hand, and we'll see how much Marquez's chin can hold up. Uh, with Johnson and Alan Green, I would give Johnson the edge. I think Green's going to stand around looking at his feet again. Uh, he doesn't realize that his, his career is slipping away. And that's the way I'm going to go with, with those two. Also, on HBO that night, on the 6th, Zab Judas taking on Lucas Mathis, which I keep getting email after email from main events. Don't think I don't appreciate it, but, you know, three or four days is more than enough. Uh, I would have thought easily that Judah was going to win this fight. I'm not so sure anymore. I think time may have caught up with him, but he's fighting in a weight at the junior welterweight limit, or the low 140s, it's going to be more conducive for his speed and power. Um, the thesis, I think 23-0 with 22 knockouts, or something 22 and 0 with 21 knockouts. Never fought the caliber of competition, but that didn't matter when Carlos Baldemir came to New York to fight Judah. Um, I'm go out on a limb and say, I, th I think Judah should squeak this out, but I wouldn't be surprised if Mathis catches him and, and does away with him. Um, Omar Nino fighting Gilberto Keb Boss in a rematch for Nino's WBC Junior Flyweight title. 
not on TV, but it's in Melvida, in Mexico. And I think that's going to about do it for this week. Well, guys, you got your wish. See you next time.